Pastor Dave Wells. Do you want this? Hey, good morning, church. Uh, this morning, I just want to share a, a, a simple word with you, and this word has been on my heart for, for several months, actually. And when I was praying about what I was going to preach about this morning, I just couldn't, couldn't get away from it. So I thought, you know, I've never, I've never shared that with you as a congregation, of what I'm about to share. And it's a simple concept, but I think it's a very vital concept. And I, what I want to talk to you about this morning is the difference between having an expectancy in the Lord and having expectation. In God, you see, well, aren't they the same thing? And the answer is no, they're not. And the last several weeks, uh, Joel's been uh, talking to us about being on the edge, being on the edge of our faith, and standing on the edge, and that, that that's where the life is, and that's where that's where God is moving, and that's what God is that's what God is doing. And I totally agree with that. I believe that we need to stand on the edge because when you're there, God's moving, God's doing things in your life, and God's doing things in you. He's doing things through you and with you. And so it's important that we stand there. So many believers are, are living their life back here. And they're not living their life over here, out, out here. And, and what I want to talk about this morning is a, a, a life posture that you and I need to have as believers. And that life posture is a, having a posture of, of an expectancy where, you're, where you, you have that expectancy in God. And say, well, well, Dave, what's the difference between expectancy and expectation. First of all, even though in the English language, those two words seem like they're, they're very related, but actually in the Greek language, they come from two different Greek words. Uh, they're not related. And uh, so a key component of expectancy is this. Say, well, what, what do you mean by expectancy? Expectancy, when I have an expectancy, it means I have hope. I have an anticipation that God is going to do something. Now, it doesn't matter what I'm going through. That if I'm going through a difficult time, if bad things are happening in my life right now, that I, I, if I have expectancy, I think, you know, in spite of these bad things, in spite of these difficult things I'm going through, something's good still going to happen here. God's going to do something. On the other side of this negative experience that I'm presently enduring or dealing with, on the other side of that, God's got something good here. And so I have this expectancy that good's going to come. No matter what I am facing, no matter what situation is in my life, I have this expectancy in God. God, you're in control. God, you're going to do something here. You're good. And somehow you don't waste anything. And, and Lord, my expectancy is in you that somehow, I'm not telling you how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, what you're going to do, but I have a, an expectancy towards you that you're going to do something powerful in my life and in this situation and the people's lives that are, that are dear to me, that, are, that, I'm, that, I, uh, that I'm concerned about. That's an attitude of expectancy. It, it means that I believe that light can overcome darkness, that life can come out of death, that it's the, it's the tenacious belief that no matter what happens, God, you're going to do something powerful here. That's expectancy. And that whatever is going on in my life, whatever negative things that are going on in my life, somehow you're going to redeem it. You're just going to do something. You're a God of redemption, and you're going to do something powerful. Well, the opposite of expectancy is expectation. <clears throat> and it's the attitude that I'm owed, that God owes me, that I deserve, that I'm entitled. Expectation makes demands. If I have expectations of people, I'm actually demanding that those people meet my expectations. Amen? I can have expectations of God. I'm demanding that God does this and this and this. And sometimes I use the Bible and say, Lord, you know, I got a couple of verses in the Bible here that says that you've got to do this for me now in this time. And we can take God's word and misuse it. And we can use it to make demands on him. Can I tell you something? You cannot manipulate God with his word or with your prayers. I believe in prayer. I believe in God's promises. Don't misunderstand me here. But I think that we use them in wrong ways. And sometimes we take his word and we even take our prayer life and we are coming at God from an attitude of expectation rather than an attitude of expectancy. And it's a whole, it's a whole different posture in, in our life. And so with expectations, I am setting the parameters in which God has to operate. Or I'm setting the parameters in which people have to operate, or a church has to operate. We can have expectations of Harvest City Church. We can have expectations of the leadership of Harvest City Church. We can have expectation of family members, relatives, 
people we work with. We can have expectations everywhere, but let me tell you something that's bad about expectations. If you have expectations, you will be disappointed because, those, because your expectations are not met. Those demands are not met, either by people or by God. And when you have expectations that are not met, you suffer what is called disappointments. So you become disappointed in this person. You become disappointed in this family member. You become disappointed in the church. You become disappointed in God. And as if you have enough disappointments, you become disappointed. When you become disappointed, then you get discouraged. You get angry. You get offended. And you withdraw. And so people quit on God. They say, God, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm done with you. Uh, I prayed these prayers and I held up these promises and you didn't do what, what I demanded that you do. We wouldn't say the word demand, but by the, by the very fact that we, the way we handle ourselves and by the very fact of our life posture, we are making demands of him. And he doesn't come through. And when he doesn't, we get angry at him. We get mad at God, quote unquote. Which when you think about it, is ridiculous. Because my Bible says God is good. He doesn't make any mistakes. He's absolutely perfect. And if that's not true about him, we don't have a God. Amen? So let's just think about this for a minute. And then we do that of the church. In Regina right now, there are hundreds and hundreds of, maybe even thousands of professing Christians who don't go to church anymore. Why? What happened to them? Well, they had expectations, which were not met. Amen? And those expectations were not realistic. I mean, if we look at Harvest City, if we look at ourselves, for example, what is Harvest City Church? Well, it's a bunch of people, it's a bunch of sinners saved by grace. Amen? When I look at, when I look at you, I see a bunch of flawed people. When you look at me, you see a flawed pastor. Amen? So is it going to be perfect? Absolutely not. Far from it. And if you have expectations of what the church should be or do, well, you're going to be disappointed. And you keep going down that road. You have that life posture. Pretty soon you won't even attending a church anymore. You'll just write it off. But what's happening is you're losing. Those people are, being, are, are suffering huge loss because they have the wrong attitude. They do not have a kingdom attitude. They have a worldly attitude, which is called expectations rather than expectancy. And so, hey, God is almighty God. We don't demand anything of him. Amen? Who do we think we are? Because when I have expectations, actually what I'm doing, especially when I have expectations toward the Lord, I'm actually elevating myself above him. And so I'm the greater, he's the lesser. And I'm telling him what he has to do, when he has to do it, how he has to do it. And how many of you know that he just doesn't respond to that? He doesn't respond to that. And what happens is I get disappointed. And then I'm in trouble. And disappointment leads to discouragement and depression. And those are, that's a dangerous place to be. Amen? <clears throat> so... Let me give you some examples of that. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18 and 19, there's, uh, just, and there's many, many examples I could uh, share with you about expectancy versus expectation. But here's, in Romans 8, 8 18, if we can have that on the screen, hopefully it's there. Uh, it says this. Paul is actually personifying uh, creation as a person. And uh, he says, uh, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of that is to be revealed to us. <laughs> I picked up this cough in India and I just can't get rid of it. Uh, <clears throat> for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. That phrase, waits eagerly, is expectancy. What Paul is telling us is this. If we look at our fallen world... Would you agree that there's a lot of negative stuff happening in our world today? Amen? I mean, the world, and from every angle, our, our world, I think scientists would tell you our world's dying. It's true. Not only is our world dying, the universe is dying. The fall of man, when Adam fell in the garden, everything fell with him. And so there's a lot of negative things happening in this world today. You turn the news on and all you hear is one negative thing after another. But can I tell you, in spite of all this negativity, in spite of all these bad things that are happening in creation, Creation is not depressed. The crea creation is not discouraged. Neither is God. Creation actually is waiting in anticipation for the manifestation of the sons of God. Who, who's that? That's you and me, church. 
that God is going to do something so powerful in his church, in his people, that somehow it's going to deliver creation. Amen? I mean, how? I don't know how. It just blows my fuses to think about it, but that's what this verse says, that creation is not depressed in discouraged, in disappointment. Rather, creation is standing on the edge with great anticipation, arms wide open, eyes wide open, in expectancy that God is going to redeem creation, which he's going to do. Amen? That's called, that's called expectancy. And that's the posture, that's the attitude of creation. That's the same posture that you and I need to have as people, as believers. They say, God, you know what? You're going to do something. You're going to do something with my kids. You're going to do something with my family. You're going to do something in my marriage. You're, going to do, you're just going to do something in this church. You're going, to do, you're, going to, you're going to do something. I have an attitude of expectancy towards life. You're going to do something in my life. That's the kind of attitude. That's a God attitude. That's an attitude that releases the power of God in your life and in your situation. But expectations actually put, are the cork in the bottle. When I, put, when I have expectations, actually, my expectations are actually nullifying the very thing that I want to see happen. I'm the problem. I'm the bottleneck. I'm the cork in the bottle. We get mad at God. We get mad at the church. We get mad at other people for not meeting our expectations. But actually, go look in the mirror. Go look in the mirror. It's actually the attitude of expectation that's the cork in the bottle that actually is preventing what God wants to do in your own life. So a kingdom attitude, a kingdom posture, is an attitude like, God, you know what? You're God and I'm not. I believe your word. I believe your Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter what negative thing I'm facing right now. God, you're somehow you're going to do something with this. Somehow there's goodness going to come out of this thing. God, I, I'm in anticipation. I'm not telling you how, when, where. I'm not telling you that. I'm worshiping you, and Lord, my attitude, I have an attitude of expectancy that you're going to move on my son or my daughter or my grandkids or my own life or, or, this, or my finances or in this situation. You're going, to, somehow you're going to move, God, and I have that expectancy in you. You know what? That pleases the Lord. That's the very best position that you can stand in. Do you understand me this morning? Expectations are making demands. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. Can I say that when you live in expectancy... It's hard to be disappointed. You're not disappointed if you're living in expectancy. It's like an antidote to disappointment, which means it's an antidote to depression, an anti antidote to discouragement. You know, uh, Simeon, in Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 35, we won't look at it in time, uh, for lack of time, but in Luke chapter 2, it's part of the Christmas story. And uh, Simeon is a, a man of God. He's an old man. He's in the temple. He's a man of prayer. And uh, there's another woman there named Anna, the prophetess. And she, she's lived basically her whole life in the temple. And the, Luke tells us that Simeon had been revealed to Simeon that before he died, he would see the Messiah. He would see the Christ. And so he's an old man now. So a man is getting close. And uh, so Simeon, he, he has this attitude of expectancy towards the Lord because you know, the attitude, the, the prevailing attitude of, of Simeon's time was when the Messiah came, he would come as a warrior with a sword in his hand, bringing fire and judgment upon the wicked and redemption for the righteous. That's what they believed the coming of the Messiah would be. They, they believed that. And they, they had lots of proof texts in the Old Testament to back that up. So that, that was their expectation. <clears throat> that was their expectation. But Simeon, he didn't have that attitude. He had an attitude of expectancy because all of a sudden Mary and Joseph show up in the temple with a little baby and Simeon recognizes him as the Messiah. And he says, he goes to the child, he prophesies over the child, prophesies over Mary. And um, he says, I can go, basically he's saying this, I can, go, I can go home and be with the Lord now. I've seen it, I've seen the Messiah. He saw what so many people didn't see. He saw what the religious leaders of his day did not see. Why? Because they had expectations of what the Messiah would be like, and they missed him. They couldn't see him. He was standing six inches in front of their nose, and they couldn't see the Son of God. But Simeon, because he had an attitude of expectancy, he saw a little baby in a mother's arm and said, there he is. There's the Messiah. He saw it. Why? Because that expectancy opened up his heart. Anna the prophetess, she saw it too. 
because they had expectancy. And so they saw what God was doing. Listen, when you have expectancy, you, you begin to understand. You begin to see God moving. You begin to see, you, you have discernment. You begin to see God moving in the church. You begin to see God, God moving in people's lives. When you have expectations of those people, when you have expectations of the church, you don't see nothing happening. You understand what I'm saying? So expectancy opens up your heart. And it allows God to begin to move. And it begins, you allow God to be God and God to do it in his way and in his time. And so that's why Simeon saw it when everybody else couldn't see it. Because he had an attitude of expectancy in his life. In contrast, one day Jesus told a parable in Matthew 20 <coughs> of the workers in the vineyard. And the parable goes like this, that uh, he, Jesus tells the story of a, of a landowner uh, going out and he hires workers to work in his vineyard. And the first, guy, the first group he hires at 9 o'clock in the morning. And he says, I'll, I'll pay you a denarius for a day's labor, which was a typical day's wage uh, in, the, in, those, in, those, in those times. And so they agreed. And so they guys start working. But then throughout the day, the landowner goes and hires at least four different times, different groups of people at different times throughout the day. And finally, the last group, only he hires at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and they only work one hour. And it's, the day's over at 6. And so then he goes to pay. Well, everybody... He, calls all the laborers together, everybody that's worked for him that day. And he starts with the group that he hired last. He only worked one hour, and he pays them a denarius. So when he did that, the first group that had been there since 9 o'clock in the morning, they saw that, and he thought, wow, he paid the guys that only worked an hour a full day's wage. Man, what's he going to give us who have worked all day in the hot sun? So when he came to, down to the, to the first group that he hired, he only paid them a denarius. They were expecting more. And so they got offended at Jesus. Said, hey, this isn't fair. You paid those guys that only worked one hour, a full day's wage. You, you, uh, those of us who worked the whole day, you, you still only gave us a full day's wage. And the landowner says, hey, did we not agree for, did I pay you a denarius for the day? So what do you got to complain about? You, you worked all day. I paid you exactly what I said. If I want to be generous to the guys at the end, I, can I not do with, with my own money what I want to do? So what happened to that first group? They had expectations. And because they had expectations, they had demands. We demand you pay us more. It's not fair that you pay these guys that worked an hour the same wage as us. And the landowner says, hey, I can do with my money whatever I want. It's my money. We, we agreed. I paid you exactly. I, I've treated you fairly. Amen? That's, so that, that first group, they stumbled because they had expectations. And that's what expectations do to you and me. It caused us to stumble. <clears throat> they feel, because they feel owed. They feel entitled. Actually, the, the Greek word that's used, it says they, they had been expecting to receive more than the denarius. That word expected is the Greek word nomais. But the word expectancy is uh, the, the Greek word apokare dokia. It's a different word entirely. And, and so they stumbled because of their expectation. And so what Matthew does is describes the attitude of expect, expectation versus the attitude of, an, of expectancy. <clears throat> because expectation says it must be this. It must be now. And if it's not this and it's not now, I'm taking my marbles and I'm going home. I'm not playing anymore. I'm out of the game. That's what expectation does. John the Baptist was, of course, an incredible man of God. And what's interesting as you follow the ministry and life of John the Baptist is that he, he started off with expectancy. The very first time that John the Baptist met Jesus is John was in his mother's womb, and Jesus was in his mother's womb. And the two girls got together, both pregnant, and the Bible says that John, when he, when, when Elizabeth, when, when Mary, sorry, the mother of Jesus, walked into the house of Elizabeth, John the Baptist leapt in his mother's womb because he recognized the Messiah, even though he's still in his mother's tummy and Jesus is in his mother's tummy. Amen? John the Baptist recognized the Messiah, just came in the room, and he had expectancy. Amen? Then, later on, when they're both men, John the Baptist is, has started his ministry, and uh, he sees Jesus one day, and he points him out and says, There, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. 
John's attitude, John's posture at that moment was expectancy. Here's the Messiah. Wow. Praise God. Incredible things are going to happen here. Amen? He had expectancy. And then, then when the time came when Jesus came to John and said, Hey, John, I want you to baptize me in water. And, and John said, uh, uh, No, nah, you need to baptize me. I'm not worthy to, to even untie your shoelaces up. Uh, you, you know, you, you need to baptize me. And she said, No, 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 no. Uh, you, need, you, need, you need to baptize me. And so John does. And when he does, he sees the Holy Spirit come upon Jesus in the form of a dove. He saw it with his eyes. And he heard the Father's voice, voice of approval, a voice endorsing Jesus as the Messiah. And John the Baptist knew, knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He knew that he was the one. And John was filled with expectancy of what Messiah was going to do. But then, as, and, but then as time went on, John the Baptist's expectancy descended into expectation. And we actually see See, well, what kind of expectations did John the Baptist have of Jesus? Well, we, we know what his expectations are from the message that John preached. Because John said this. His message actually reveals his expectations. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 3, verse 16, it says, John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water. But one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John had two expectations of Jesus, that he would baptize people in the Holy Spirit, which he's still doing, by the way, and that he would baptize people with fire. Now, what does it mean to be baptized with fire? What's John thinking? What's John, what's John talking about? He's talking about judgment. The baptism of fire is when the Messiah comes, he's going to baptize this world in fire. He's going to judge this world. He's going to consume the sinners. And he's going to pour out his spirit on the righteous, but the unrighteous get fire. They get judgment. That's what, that's what, he, was, that's what he was expecting. You say, well, where did he get that expectation from? Well, he got it from the prophet Joel. If you read the prophet Joel, uh, because, hey, John preached out of the Old Testament. So did Jesus, by the way. So did the early church preach out of the Old Testament because they didn't have a new at this point. They were writing it. So John got his sermon material from the Old Testament. And where is he getting the whole idea of fire, baptism of fire? Well, he get it from the prophet Joel, chapter 2. And here's what Joel says. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there ever be again after it. To the years of many generations, a fire consumes before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but a desolate wilderness behind them, and nothing at all escapes them. And so, this is where John's getting his fire and brimstone message from. When he was preaching, he's saying, repent. Repent. The time is at hand. What John actually believed is that the Messiah was coming, and when he was coming, he was going to bring fire, he was going to bring judgment, and the time is short, and you need to turn to God right now, or you're going to be burnt to a crisp. That's his message. He says, the axe is laid to the roots. Amen? In fact, when the, when the Pharisees came out at one point and said, you bunch of vipers, who warned you about the judgment that is to come? Amen? That's his message. He's expecting that when the Messiah comes, man, he's crisp and everything that needs to be crisp. That's his expectation. Amen? And it became an expectation. This is what he was believing that God, the Messiah, was going to do. And then if you read through the prophet Joel, if you read the rest of, of Joel chapter 2, after all the fire... Then it talks about the early rain and the latter rain and the Holy Spirit coming and the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the earth and upon the people. So John's expectation, his theological expectation, was that fire comes first, then comes the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Then comes the baptism. So it was the baptism of fire, number one. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is number two. But what happens is when Jesus the Messiah starts to minister, he flips it around. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is coming first, and there's no fire. 
Amen? Hey, where's the baptism of fire? Hey, 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 hey Jesus, well, are you the Messiah? And so John's in prison, and he's about to lose his head. And, uh, and so uh, he's got two problems. He's got a theological problem, and he's got a, he's got a personal problem. And that's exactly what happens to you and me. We end up with a theological problem, and then we end up with a personal problem because we have wrong theology. Or we use the theology, we build this nice theological box, and God doesn't operate in the box that we created for him. And, then, and th that box is designed to look after my personal problems. And so because the God is not operating in the box the way I think he should, then my personal problems are not being dealt with the way I want them to be dealt with. So I am very disappointed. Amen? <coughs> so, John builds his box. And so, John's saying to the people, you got to be ready, man. Fire's coming. So then John's in prison, and he's about to die. And man, I haven't seen any fire. So then he sends two of his disciples. Man, you, we better, I better check this out. So he sends two of his disciples to Jesus. He says, and he, he says to his disciples, go ask Jesus this question. And the question was, are you the one, or should we expect somebody else? That was the question. Are you, are you really the Messiah? Because there's no fire. I, there's mercy, and there's, there's all this stuff, but where's the fire? Where's the, where's, where's the crisping? And so I don't, so the disciples come and ask Jesus the question. So here's what Jesus' response is. He says to him, you stand right here. You stand right here, and you watch this. And if you read it, you read it, you read it in Luke chapter 7. He says, you stand right here. And while they're standing right there, Jesus starts healing the sick. He starts healing blind eyes. He starts setting people free. And they're watching it. John, two disciples are watching this happen. Then he says to them, you go tell John what you have both seen and heard. And then Jesus sends a message back. He says, you go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now, when Jesus sent that phrase, Jesus is very deliberate about what he quoted, because actually what Jesus is quoting is Isaiah which John is very familiar with because it was a prophet Isaiah that prophesied about John the Baptist's ministry. So John's proof text for who he is and his ministry is rooted in the book of Isaiah, and so is the Messiah. So is Jesus' ministry proof text in the book of Isaiah, as well as other books, but certainly in the book of Isaiah. So Jesus quotes Isaiah to John. And so because we say, well, what, what verse is Jesus quoting? Isaiah 35, 46, which says, Say to those with anxious heart, Take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer. The tongue of the dumb will shout for joy. Then Isaiah 61, 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and freedom to the prisoners. So Jesus deliberately summarizes his work and ministry in the book of Isaiah. And so John, he knows that the book of Isaiah is his proof text for his own ministry. And so that would have been very significant for John. And so basically what Jesus is saying this, because John's about to lose his life, and he says, you know, I got a problem here, Jesus. Theologically, you're not doing what I thought you would do. And secondly, you're delivering everybody else, but you're not delivering me. And I'm about to die here, and you've forgotten about me. So Jesus sends word back to John and said, hey, John, you got this theologically, you got this backwards. I'm pouring out mercy and grace and the Holy Spirit first, and then the fire is going to come. You see, John thought it was all going to happen in one shot. There would be fire, then the Holy Spirit, all bang, bang. And then period. What Jesus did is he came and elongated the period. He said, oh, John, my coming right now is the beginning of the end. So can I tell you something, church? Right now, we're still living in the end. We're, living in the be we're still living in end times. But when Jesus came, it was the beginning of the end. That was over 2,000 years ago. He's coming at the end of the end. When he comes at the end of the end, believe me, there will be fire. Amen? There will be fire. 
But in God's grace and mercy and in his divine wisdom, God gave, poured out the Holy Spirit first with mercy and grace. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad he come out, he, that he flipped it around and poured out mercy and grace and salvation? Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Amen? And fire's coming at the end. And so he said, hey, John, I flipped it around theologically because I'm God and I can do what I want. Amen? And you know, Joel kind of had the order wrong. Joel prophesied it, but I'm doing it backwards because I'm the son of man and I'm the son of God and I'm doing it the other way around. And by the way, John, I'm not delivering you anyhow. <laughs> Amen? So that's the way it works. So... <clears throat> Can I tell you something that we, we, we do the very same thing as John the Baptist. We create theological boxes. And we do it in all kinds of ways. We, we create boxes of healing, faith and healing, don't we? We get, all, we get a bunch of verses out of the Bible and we say, you know, positive confession and, and we get verses about divine healing and we put them in a box and we say, okay, uh, if I confess the right things and I confess these promises and I yell real loud, and I pour oil on people, and I rub the hair off their head, uh, they have to be healed. And they have to be healed in, because I said in the name of Jesus, and I have the verses here that says that they have to be healed. And, but the problem is this. No matter how, what kind of box you want to build, you can't get all the verses in the box because not all the verses fit the box. So if you're building a box on, on healing, you can't include verses on suffering. They don't fit the box. Amen? So you leave them out. And, and, and it doesn't matter what box you want to build, you can never build a perfect theological box that God has to operate within. But we keep doing it. And so we build boxes on parenting. We build theological boxes on parenting. We build theological boxes on divorce and remarriage. We build divorces. We build theological boxes on all kinds of things. Amen? And then we get mad when somehow God didn't operate in the box that I created for him. We're doing the very same thing that John the Baptist did. We create expectations which makes demands. And I, can I tell you something? The very, that doing that actually works against the very thing we want God to do. Instead of having expectations and theological boxes, the Bible never presents truth in boxes. Never. The Bible presents truth in tension. And so it gives us all these different verses about various aspects of life, and these verses pull. And we have to hold them in tension. And we don't like that very much. We would rather have the box because then we feel like we're in control. If I'm in the box, then I'm in control. And I want to be in control. If I have to hold the truth in tension, I'm not in control. God's in control, and we want to be in control. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So you can't do that. doesn't mean we don't have good theology, but I want to tell you something. You cannot build a box that's going to contain him. Right? Because then the box is greater than him. And it doesn't work that way. And so forget the boxes. Let's forget the expectations. Let's have a posture of expectancy. Amen? Let God be God. And, and, and I think you'll, we'll see a lot of things happen. We, we see it, for example, in the woman caught in the very act of adultery in John 8. And, of course, they catch this woman in the very act of adultery. So there's no question that she's in immorality. They bring her, the Pharisees bring her to, bring her to Jesus to test him to see what he's going to do. Their box said, stone her. That's their theological box. And they had all kinds of scripture from the Old Testament in the box to say that that woman should be stoned. So Jesus says, okay. He plays, he plays along with him for a bit. He said, all right. Okay. You without sin, you get to throw the first rock. And he's kind of writing something on the ground there and scribbling around, not even paying attention, it seems. And uh, there's silence. And then eventually, they start, the crowd starts dis dissipating. The old guy starts with the old, goes down to the young. The young guys are the last to leave because they're the most narrow-minded, actually. And uh, finally, everybody's gone. He just blew that box right up. And he says to the woman, what? Nobody here to condemn you? She says, no, no one, Lord. And, she, and Jesus says these words, neither do I. But then he says, go and sin no more. Stop it. Stop the immorality. I'm not condemning you. I'm not stoning you. You're free. Stop doing this. Amen? He blew up that box. <clears throat> we must set aside our preconceptions of how God is supposed to work. 
we need to have an attitude of expectancy. You know, it's interesting that Jesus never gave his disciples exact descriptions of what was going to happen. He never ever lined it up exactly how it was going to happen. And the disciples kept getting shocked at what was happening and what wasn't happening. <clears throat> Our problem is, John's problem was, he didn't see any fire, and God was working too slowly. And we have the same problem. Our expectations are not met, and God seems to be too slow in terms of what he's going to do. Let me, let me close with this story. When I was in Vietnam here a few weeks ago, uh, we were ministering to, to the leaders. Uh, we did both. We, we ministered to the leaders, then we ministered to the congregation. So we, we ministered, Doug Paradise and I, and Anatoly, we ministered for four days. And uh, in the last couple of days, uh, Doug and I thought, you know, let's prophesy over everybody who's here. Well, that's, that's a big order. So I said to Doug, you know what, we're, we're just going to, here's how we're going to do it. I'll pick out somebody, you pick out somebody. I'll pick out, we'll just pick them out, and we're only going to prophesy no more than a minute. We're going to give bang, bang, bang. We're not going to prophesy long. If I prophesy over that person, you don't. If you prophesy, I don't. Because otherwise, we'll never get through all these people. So we start taking turns. We start pulling people out, prophesying. There was a woman, <clears throat> there was a woman there, and I noticed her when I was ministering. She was really depressed, really discouraged. And if anybody, she just looked like there was doom and gloom all over her. She didn't speak English, so I couldn't talk to her or communicate with her. And uh, her husband was there, though I didn't know that. Uh, her husband was a pastor, actually. They were both pastors. Her husband was so discouraged that he was going to quit the ministry. But after those four days of ministry, he was totally rejuvenated. But his wife was totally, de I never saw a more depressed-looking person. And she was just so down. I thought, wow, she's got a load of bricks on her shoulder somehow. So, well, I can't remember who it was. Either Doug or I, we, we pulled her out. And we prophesied over her. I don't, see, what did you prophesy over her? I don't remember. I don't remember what we prophesied over her. But we prophesied over her, and she left. It was at the end of the day. She left. Um, the next day she came back, she was transformed. I mean, she was glowing. I thought, she had a big smile on her face. I thought, whoa, what happened to her? So then we, we had a time of sharing at the end. We just let the Vietnamese kind of share what these last four days had meant to them and what they'd gotten out of it. And so different people were sharing. And she stood up and she said, you know, she said, I was so discouraged and so wiped out. And you guys prophesied over me. And then she said, I, I left. We went out of the building. And she said, I, I have had chronic pain in my body for years. She had something wrong with her back. And she said, I live in chronic pain. And I've tried everything. I just can't get rid of this pain. And she said, after the meeting, I was just, she was, she was going somewhere. And she said, after a couple hours, she realized, you know what? I'm pain free. I don't even have pain. My pain's gone. And she realized, I'm totally healed. And so the next day when she came back, she said, I'm totally healed. I have no more pain. That as she left the meeting, God healed her. Now, we didn't pray for her for healing. We didn't do that. What did we do? We prophesied over her. You know, in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 14, the Bible says this. Desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you would prophesy. And I, for years, I used to wonder about that. Say, God, Paul, why would you want us, why would you elevate prophecy above everything else? Uh, he says that, that the church might be edified, which means being built up. Built up means encouraged. I said, why is that so important? Why, if it had been me writing 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, I said, desire especially a spiritual gift, but especially that you might heal the sick. That's what I would have put in that blank. Amen? Or especially that you might do miracles. Or especially that you might have the gift of faith. That's what I would have put in that blank. I definitely would not have put prophecy in there. Would you? I would not have put prophecy in there. But 1 Corinthians 14 talks all about prophecy. It contrasts prophecy and speaking in tongues. And because both those gifts edify. that Speaking in tongues builds up and edifies the individual. And prophecy builds up and edifies the church. So we prophesy over this woman. And she goes out and gets healed. Bam. What happened? Here's what I think happened. You see, when you prophesy over somebody, a word of encouragement, it creates expectancy in that person. And what happened to her is, Doug and I prophesied over her, 
and expectancy came into her heart, and bam, Jesus healed her. Because her posture had changed. Her whole life posture had changed. Up until then, she was depressed and discouraged because she had all these expectations that were not being met, and she was full of disappointment, which was actually blocking the very thing that she wanted God to do for her. But when we prophesied over her, it busted that. Expectancy rose in her heart. Bam, she was healed. Amen? That's why the prophetic is so powerful. Amen? It's so powerful because it actually increases, it actually can launch people into an attitude of expectancy. You know what? I'm in a bad situation right now, but somehow on the other side of that, good's going to come. Somehow God's going to redeem this thing. I have an, an expectancy. So listen to you. Listen to me, mom and dad. Some of you are disappointed in your kids. Can I tell you something? You need to have an attitude of expectancy and drop your expectations. And some of you kids can be disappointed in your parents. Some of you grandparents can be disappointed. You can be disappointed in the church. You can be disappointed about lots of things. Some of you are here today and you're disappointed about God. Can I tell you something? Drop your expectations. Rather adopt an attitude, a posture of expectancy and let God be God. Amen? Because when you're in that kind of an attitude, you can't be disappointed. You're immune from disappointment. If you're immune from disappointment, you're immune from discouragement. If you're immune from discouragement, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen? And you go from strength to strength because you're moving in the joy of the Lord. You're not moving in expectations that are not being met. Expectations will steal your joy. When it steals your joy, it steals your strength. Are you hearing me? Amen? It's a, it's a way, it's a different mindset. We need to have a biblical kingdom mindset of expectancy towards God and that God be God in your life. And here's what happens. When you do that, God keeps surprising you. Surprise. Surprise. Can I tell you something? When that woman stood up and testified, you know what? I was totally healed. I was surprised. She was surprised. Amen? She wasn't expecting to be healed. She just left with some expecting in her heart. Bam! Amen? That's how powerful that really is. Let's stand. I'm going to pray for you. If, I'm going to pray a general prayer right now over you. If some of you are here this morning and you're, you're just, you know, you've really been struggling with disappointment and discouragement, uh, we, we're, we're glad to minister to you today. If you want to come forward, we'll, we'll, definitely, we'll definitely have a prayer team here that will pray for you and stand with you. Maybe some of you need to actually come to this altar and throw your expectations down right here. Amen? You know what they are. Maybe you need to say, you know what, I've had these expectations for a long time of whether it be of people or family members or of God or the church. Some of you need to come forward and just throw those expectations down right here and leave them here and walk out this door with expectancy in your God and let God be God and see what God's going to do. Amen? And you have a smile on your face and you have the joy of the Lord in your heart instead of a spirit of heaviness. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this congregation this morning. I pray, Lord, God, we want to repent for making demands. We want to repent, Lord, for, for actually developing expectations of you, of other people, of family members. We repent of that today. And God, we ask you to forgive us. We're God, we're going to cast down those expectations right now. We're going to cast them down right now. Lord, you're sovereign. We can't change one life. We can't even change our own life. We need your help. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to change ourselves. What chance do we have of changing anybody else? And so, Lord, we just right now choose to adopt an attitude of expectancy, which is a kingdom culture, which is a kingdom attitude. And, God, we're going to go stand on the edge of our faith with an attitude of expectancy to what you're going to do in the church, what you're going to do in our nation, what you're going to do in this world, what you're going to do in our family members, our kids, our grandkids, what you're going to do in our own lives. God, we have an expectancy in you that you're going to transform, that you're going to set the captives free, that you're going to pour out your spirit, continue to pour out your spirit, that you're going to deliver, that you're going to open blind eyes, you're going to set free the oppressed, you're going to deliver from oppression and discouragement. Lord, we believe that. We have an expectancy. Lord, that you're going to move in your way, in your time. We're not going to tell you how to do it, when to do it, how to do it. God, we just release you. 
to move in our hearts. And Lord, we just want to say we have an attitude of expectancy. And we're saying to you, Lord, surprise us. Surprise us. Lord, you want us to live a life of continually being surprised. And Lord, that's such incredible joy comes out of that. And so, Lord, we want to thank and praise you. And I pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning, both young and old. God, set the captives free today. Set them free from expectations. Father, give them a revelation, an understanding of expectancy and the power. Lord, let us join creation. Let us join creation with an attitude as we wait eagerly. Wait eagerly, Lord, for the manifestation of the sons of God. We're waiting eagerly for what you're going to do. And Lord, we want to say thank you. And we trust you this morning. And we trust ourselves into your hands today. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going